Welcome everyone. Um, uh, I'm George Blumenthal. I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Studies in Higher Education. And I wanna welcome you to today's talk. Um, we're really delighted today. We're going to hear a, pre a presentation on big data and academic profession studies and discuss both the advantages and limitations to using big data in such studies. And this is obviously a topic that's gonna be, is of ever greater importance and will, will continue to be as our capabilities increase as well. And we're particularly fortunate today to have one of the world's experts actually giving this presentation. Um, our speaker today is Merrick Greek, who's a professor and shareholder and a UNESCO chair in institutional research and higher educational policy, and the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Science and Humanities at the University of Poznan in Poland. His research area is quantitative studies of science and higher education research and policy. And he's published at least 220 papers on, the, on, on various subjects in this area. And his recent monograph is Changing European Academics, a Comparative Study of Social Stratification, Work Patterns, and Research Productivity. I think I look forward to a really interesting presentation. And Merrick, at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so, thank you so much, George. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, and it's a sentimental journey as I, as I spent a fantastic academic year at Berkeley at some point. I'm happy, I'm happy to be back. Let me start and let me open the presentation now. And uh, yes, uh, uh, George, I hope it is, it is perfect. You, you, you can see it right now. Uh, I cannot. Okay, let me let me let me try. Uh, okay, share again, and it should be fine. It is there now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, as George said, big data in the in the academic profession studies somehow distinct topics, which I will try to link today. Um, a few questions first. Um, the future of academic profession research in the digital age, data around, what is the future of, 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 of this, this area of research? What new opportunities are provided by big data? What are advantages and limitations? And the comparison which I will pre 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 present uh, of survey data and uh, bibliometric data or biobibliometric data. I will also discuss the competitors to academic profession studies, who they are, what they do, what they have that we do not routinely have. And finally, final question, uh, new data sources and methodologies. Is it a must for academic career research? My provisional answer today will be yes, it is a must. We have to think more about it. So the, the, the two issues, academic profession and big data. Well, there are new, as we all know, there are new opportunities for collecting, storing, analyzing data about academics new sources to study academic careers. We can see it around. We can read dozens of new studies based on big data. I believe it's a not to be, not to be missed opportunity for this type of research. However, certainly there are risks, there are costs, and there are uncertainties, which I will certainly discuss. What is available, for instance, surprisingly, enormous amounts of data which are longitudinal in nature, like data for five years or data for 10 years. It's not for free in terms of money and in terms of risks, but is, it is available. So what we can do, we can be asking new research questions and we can be doing empirically driven theorizing about academics. And it's basically new. By empirical driven, I mean big, much, much bigger, num larger numbers of observations. I will give you examples in a moment, about a dozen of papers and three strands of my own research, how to work with big data and what, key, what can be achieved. So we are experiencing, experiencing an immensely expanded scale and scope of social research, also academic career research. Also, we can see heightened social expectations, including expectations 
from us. We know we can know more and everyone around wants to know more. So big data refers to the specific data sets that are large in both size and complexity. What we do, we extract useful information, we seek patterns and we theorize about it. Um, I prefer structured data like Scopus raw data or Web of Science raw data or national registries of scientists, the various types of structured data. I'm not using unstructured data at all at the moment. So what we can do with big data, we can study large patterns that would otherwise be just imperceptible. We can study outliers, for instance, very highly productive scientists globally. We can study the various deviations, which normally we are unable, we are unable to do. Uh, why, why studying the global academic profession now? There is one, one perhaps most important factor the availability, the availability of digital data on scholarly inputs and scholarly outputs. By these, I mean research funding, data about research funding, data about productivity, well, indirectly, data about collaboration, about mobility, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that new data and computer power is almost at our fingertips, knowing certainly that almost does, that does, does make a difference. It's almost available for many and in many places it's not. So what is perhaps most important is that our research agenda in higher education research, academic profession studies, are these agendas are studied under different labels. We need to remember the same or similar questions emerge in science of science, or they emerge in research on research, or in computational social science, or in quantitative science, science studies, et cetera, et cetera. So academic careers, my topic and my topic today also, is studied from all possible angles under above labels and far beyond. So what it means, it means basically competition. We in higher education research are facing new rival fields pursuing similar research agendas. And it's important to remember that there's competing scholars and competing fields publish their success stories and, and their research in top journals, in science, in nature, in proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, et cetera, just top journals. So my question is, is it to an extent an existential challenge to higher education research field? And another question, how to survive, how to survive in the future if we are all surrounded by these expansionary newcomers and their huge data, how to survive? Can we do, how do, can we proceed as we did in the past? Is it business as usual? My answer is, it's probably not. And to an extent, it is a challenge. So how I'm looking at, at academic profession um, at the moment, I'm looking at, at, at the profession through digital traces. We academics leave traces in our publications and we can examine them. We can combine these traces with biographical traces, administrative traces, with the various data sets, both national and international. We trace using various analysis like temporal, topical, geographical, network analysis, all types of analysis. We can trace academics and their careers, that is basically us, over the years, or across institutions, or enormously important for me as men and women, we used to have scientists. Now in the data, we have men and women, suddenly and unexpectedly in millions. We can study and trace academics as juniors and seniors, and we can trace them through disciplines with different levels of granularity. So we can measure the profession with enormous precision. Obviously, there are things we cannot measure, but there are also things which we can measure. So it means we have some limitations. Perhaps the major limitation is I'm talking about publishing academics. Those non-publishers or non-performers do not exist in data sets. So there are also some inherent biases to big data databases. We all know the details, we know the biases, but still I believe it's useful to have a look around. We have to know our competitors. You know the labels, science on science, 
but also uh, the, what is the competition about? My question is, the competition is as always about prestige and resources. For instance, what is widely read and widely cited? What is valued in scholarly terms? Well, which means prestige generation. What is publicly fundable, which is resource generation? Where top minds, young minds go to do research on academic profession? Do they go to education faculties or do they go to data or computing, computing uh, departments? It's a big issue. So the competition is basically about the future, the future of academic profession studies. Now, very briefly, I have a, a small selection of academic career studies, which basically use big data. These are people, men and women who produce fantastic papers, produce great research, which is, which is discussed worldwide just to give you some, some, some feeling of what's going on, because we routinely don't read those, the, those papers. I believe most of us higher education scholars. For instance, uh, in all those cases, the authors refer to millions of scientists or hundreds of thousands of scientists or refer to millions of publications. And as I said before, they seek patterns. And these are patterns which we have been studying in our area for at least half a century. We are talking about, say, productivity and changes over time from a lifetime, life, life cycle perspective. The rapid rise, gradual decline trajectory. We thought it's always like this. And the computing scientists say it describes only 20% of scientists, this pattern, rapid rise and gradual decline in productivity. Or, we studied, uh, and I also studied elite scientists for years. I studied European elite scientists. And, um, and, and in these areas I'm talking about, uh, there, are, there are papers which show that there is only 150,000 scientists who publish every year from year to year for many years. And they produce most papers, they, re they receive most citations, et cetera, et cetera. These, these, uh, these papers discuss women and men in science. They discuss productivity of men and women. They discuss based on million who are newcomers. Okay, say in the past few years, who is coming new to science? Are they mostly men or mostly women? And are the percentages changes? They are changing indeed. Based for instance, on 1 million offers, there is a question, is it, is it, is it useful to, to collaborate with top scholars? Yes, it is. If you collaborate with top scholars when you are young, your, your advantage continues throughout your lifetime to the rest of your career. If you, if you collaborate with big mind, with minds when you are young. And the, the, the answer is based on 1 million offers. So I'm not getting into the details, but especially studies of women, studies of, of, of um, gender gaps, studies of motherhood and productivity, uh, um, say motherhood penalty, et cetera, et cetera, are around. And we basically do not, do not, are not so much aware of the data behind these studies. But one more thing, and we move forward. I'm not only talking about academic career studies with big data. I'm also talking about large scale surveys. This presentation is about surveys versus big data, but there are also new surveys closely linked to big data. And you have four, four examples on the right, big global surveys of hundreds of thousands or big dozens of, of thousands of, of, of scientists, like related to parenthood or related to parenting penalty in productivity or related to principal investigators. Basically, you need sampling frames taken for web of science or from Scopus to have so many observations and so many and so many cases. So academic career studies and big data, and also surveys and big data. Uh, what it all means uh, for the future. And uh, this is, this is a, a major issue. What is the possible impact of education research of those globalization things in the future? There is certainly a pressure to use large data sets and the pressure to use large numbers of observations to draw valid conclusions. It's clear. 
if you if you, it's different when you have 1000 and it's different when you have 100000 and when you have one country and you have well say 20 countries it just makes a difference today there's a pressure also there's the pressure comes for for numbers big numbers come from academia us readers our scholar readers and also it comes from funders or policy makers uh, it's not so much that only statistically significant results matter. It also matters what is relevant, what is attractive, what is convincing in terms of scholarly results. Also policy implications matters. And certainly policy implications from studies with big numbers are potentially bigger than policy implications from studies with small numbers. And it's just, just a matter of fact. So there is a pressure to quantify intensively academic careers, my area, my issues. I spent a decade with CAP and EURAC surveys. I spent a decade with having 1000 observations per country. And I wrote a book and many, many papers. And I know all the limitations very well. I'm saying surveys are very much needed, but big data are also useful. So we have new opportunities and these opportunities are used by our competitors. We in higher education research are only beginning to use them. I have some colleagues who publish in Scientometrics and Journal of Informatics. We all go to different venues rather than higher education because it's somehow somehow more welcome in those places. Uh, anyway, the scale of, of, of av availability of data is unimaginable today. And my suggestion is it's we cannot have a business as usual attitude today. We just can't. So what I'm suggesting, basically, you can see on the right, many, many books, publications, and, and the scientists. I suggest a, a, a transition from publications to scholars as a unit of analysis. I'm suggesting a transition from global metadata on publications to global metadata on scholars, which is the beginning of global academic profession studies. Just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of academics globally. So we can move from millions of publications to thousands or hundreds of thousands of scholars, and we can study their attributes or their characteristics using new tools and new data. It's just an opportunity which I'm, which I'm suggesting. I'm, I'm also suggesting all the limitations which we know uh, in surveys. We know those limitations. Uh, we know that, um, that when we apply disciplines and we apply age, or seniority, or collaboration type, or gender, or all of them combined, our, our observations, the number of our observations go down and down. And it's a serious issue. You start with, say, 1,200 observations for a country, which looks nice. And when you apply those clusters, you divide those observations by discipline, say, six, or by age group, say, four, or seniority, say, junior and senior, the numbers go down to very small. Um, therefore, very briefly, I'm using ever larger samples in, in my research in the past, say, 15 years. I was working with academic survey data, like thousands of questionnaires returned. It was fine. Uh, then I was working with, with uh, a, a, an excellent Polish data set, Laboratory of Polish Science, with 100,000 scientists, 25,000 with doctorates, which is very fine. And now we are, we are working in, in Poznan with global data sets and the global surveys. On the right, I'm not discussing it, it's just the method which we, we used with Dr. Wojciech Roszka to have our laboratory of Polish science data sets. We use various methods to arrive finally at, at the data set, which we used in several very, very nice papers. Speaking of papers, we studied men and women, well, not the scientists, but men and women through individual publication portfolios. We produce or constructed portfolios for every Polish scientist, every in the past two years. And the, and the publication portfolio was for a decade. And we started men collaborating with men and women collaborating with women. And we also collaborate, we also discussed uh, solo research and how men and women were, uh, work differently in, 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 in solo research. We also discussed gender disparities in international collaboration. But now the new themes ongoing right now are OECD area. We are studying 38 countries, the whole OECD area. You can see impossible signs all over on the right. 
these are the limits. And I, I will explain the, 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 my point briefly. The limits of server-based research. Let us suppose we want to compare highly productive, not just productive, by, but highly productive young academics, academics under 40, who work in STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, in the research intensive universities, and we want the results by gender. This is the point. If we have a survey sample of 1,000, our numbers go down to dozens of academics only. And we know it's complicated. When we send our papers to journals, everyone knows it. It's a big issue. So we need bigger numbers. So let's suppose we don't want a snapshot like one year studied, say the year of when, when, when survey, where survey was based, but we want to see changes over time within a decade. And the answer to this is impossible. One of those yellow signs on the right, it's just impossible to, have, to see changes over time from surveys. We cannot have longitudinal comparison. It's impossible. We cannot compare whatever across Europe of 27 countries, because as in my case, we had only 11 countries, and it's a big limitation. We cannot compare, say, OECD economies, or we cannot compare whatever on a yearly basis. So you see the point. Academic profession studies based on surveys look, as I put it here, a bit powerless. Perhaps new methods may need to be explored, and they indeed are explored. So, well, survey studies are re referring to points in time, one year, or points in the world, 10 countries, or a limited number of questions, because, because we value respondents' time. Uh, we use all surveys, and my answer is it's very good, rightly so because part of our knowledge and understanding of academics can come only through surveys and only from surveys. So I'm criticizing surveys, knowing that they are unavoidable and they're absolutely, absolutely compatible to an extent with big data. What we can do only for surveys, and I will explain in a moment what we can do only for big data, only for surveys, just to give you some examples. We are all well aware of them say, for instance, working time distribution, yeah, teaching versus research time distribution, or academic satisfaction. All those issues have been studying, studied based on surveys in the past half a century. We have no other ways to study it today, teaching versus research time, or rate your own salary, please, or what type of mentorship did you receive as a PhD? Or did you want to leave your academic job? What are your views about what scholarship is? Your working conditions, academic freedom, marriage, children, and parental leaves, et cetera, et cetera. All these issues can be tackled exclusively for surveys. And we do it, and we do it. Uh, but what can we do through big data? It's a different story. We can study research pro productivity through various publication types through various journal types. We can study various types of collaboration, not only international and national, but also same-sex or mixed-sex collaboration. We can study team size as part of collaboration studies. We can study scholarly impact. We can study mobility and its types, not only, well, national and international, but also cross-sectoral, academia versus hospital versus industry versus something else. We can study many things, which I'm showing here, research funding and its types, academic credits and authorship types, and the scale is just unimaginable. I'm saying this because people are doing this as we speak. We have dozens of, 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 of publications right now doing all I'm talking about at a scale unimaginable, normally in academic profession studies as we know it. So all above can be studied by gender by age, by seniority. And it can be also studied not only based on one year, but also dynamically in say 20 years, year from year. This is the power of big data. And I'm coming slowly to the end, showing just three examples of my own research and concluding. My own research, example one, quantifying the graying of the academic profession. We know 
these issues have been studying for again more than half a half a half a century the graying of the professoria and we are studying right now in poznan age profiles of the academic workforce worldwide across disciplines across gender and also across time in the past three decades by the way i will be talking about it at rice's seminar in europe at the university of logano next month it was advertised just before we met this morning so we, we use sex differences we use different disciplines we used various variables i'm not going to discuss the variables except maybe for one discipline how do we find discipline for millions of scientists just to, to give you an example we take lifetime publications and we take references from all publications lifetime and publications are attached to journals and journals are attached to uh to to disciplines so we take the mode the dominating discipline in all cited reference it's just an example how you work with big data and so this is example one example two is i've been studying highly cited researchers ten thousand or so from clarivate analytics and these are questions which we can answer only using big data just just listen how many papers do scientists need to become an hcr or where they are housed in which institutions and which cities what is the female participation among them it's 20 percent by the way does research intensity of institutions housing hcr matter yes it does what is their what is their age distribution what is their publication patterns is it does international collaboration crowd out national collaboration for them there's a number of issues which we can study exclusively using big data it's just impossible to ask any of these questions without access to big data and the uh, example number three and conclusions um once highly productive almost always highly productive this is an example taken from a polish study for which we had to be used we had to use uh global data or or big data we took all full professors and we studied their productivity today when they were associate professors and when they are when they were assistant professors so you can see the productivity classes on the right you have med which is medical scientists sciences we, we did it for 14 14 uh, 14 disciplines and total is for all of them and what is clear from these analysis using big data that 50 percent of top performers are top performers all their lives over 30 years and also 50 percent of low performers the bottom you see at the bottom are always bottom performers or low performers just people don't change much some of them change most of them does not when you want to look at the passages from top top productivity to low bottom productivity you see how this line is 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 um, is slim it's so small you know the numbers going from top to bottom productivity over lifetime are so small so it has implications for for uh, for um, hiring people and it's, it has implications for keeping people in universities and it's certainly going to be a a contribution to academic productivity theories it's still work in progress it's almost finished but what is also in progress is the last line considering consider 38 38 oecd countries global productivity transition patterns we do it for millions exactly five millions of scientists and we and we measure productivity retroactively current productivity past productivity at two stages for, for globally it's not about um, academic positions it's about years in service or years from the first publication and this is just an example 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 number three national study using big data and the final words for me and 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 that's all most of all we in academic profession studies compete with computer scientists we compete with them every day 
if you look at the at the journals, this is where they publish and what we well could and should be reading because they write about academic profession and academic careers. They have access to new data and to computational power. We higher education community have better theoretical frameworks. This is important. They do calculations and they provide uh, numbers. We provide ideas. And now our advantage is we've been producing these ideas for more than half more, for more than a half a century. So this is our advantage. But the data scientists turn to our issues, the issues we traditionally explored in higher education research. Increasingly, they study men and women, they study productivity, they study mobility, they study whatever. And we've been doing it for decades. This is a challenge for us. So we need to consider becoming, as I put it here, a bit more data intensive, a bit more data intensive. We, we need to be seeking more data to be able to compete with rivals who are expansionary. What is the competition for? It's for recognition, but it's also for funding. It's also for space in top journals, for tenure, finally for citations. We are in a competitive situation right now. What we need right now, we need to understand how they do what they do, how new opportunities are used by them in our area, which is academic profession studies. What I'm suggesting is a combination of national level and global level studies. What I'm doing right now, we use national studies as tool testing, and then we move on to global level, uh, seeing the advantages and seeing how it works. So is, is big data for all higher education research? It's not but it certainly can refresh academic career studies. If you ask me about universities or students or whatever, maybe big data would not work. But if you ask me about academic career studies, big data work perfectly, or at least are promising or are refreshing to ideas that we have and we have been having for, for many decades. Personally, what I'm doing, that's the, the last, la, last, last sentence perhaps today, I'm moving into global academic profession area which is a new area, not cross country or cross national studies, but global studies. I'm moving into global big data enhanced surveys. So not surveys based on representative samples, but big surveys kind of convenient samples with big numbers of observations. And finally, I'm using national data sets national registries, Polish registry of scientists combined with Scopus. So global data set, and I'm just trying to see what happens. And this presentation is one of the examples when I'm trying to see what happens uh, when I'm moving to new, to new terrains. Thank you so much. I'm closing the uh, screen sharing and we can move on to, to, to a discussion if only possible. I'm very much interested in your reactions. Well, thank you, Merrick. This is fantastic. Uh, um... I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. And I, for one, am really enthusiastic about actually reading some of these papers that you mentioned, because I think there's some interesting results that are out there already. So um, thank you so much for this presentation. So to the people that are out there, if you would like to submit a question and you're watching this on YouTube, you can certainly submit a question to us through uh, the YouTube chat function. And I will try to get to as many questions as possible that people have submitted. So um, this is, you know, we have a number of questions already, but there's still room for more questions. So please feel free to submit any questions that come to your mind and we'll try to get to them in real time before this presentation concludes. So let me start with one, with a question that was submitted uh, uh, before the talk even began. It was um, from someone who asked that um, he wanted to hear more about the data quality bibliometric data on universities in post-communist countries such as Yugoslavia, where um, there's been a lot of name changes and inconsistent tagging of research affiliations. Is that a problem, the ability to actually uh, follow the, you know, follow those changes? Uh, yes, it's, it's an excellent question because it, 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 it gives us a, a, a space to discuss several issues. First, we have problems with data around, and there are, no, there are no perfect data. Our survey data and our big data are not perfect, and we know it. 
for some countries, they are more, they are better. For other countries, they are worse. If we consider, for instance, Far East countries like China or Vietnam or Japan, the disambiguation issue is a big issue. The gender issue is a big issue. And if you think, for instance, of Poland or Russia, 95% of cases are gen well gender defined or sex defined. So depending on the country, we have different problems. For some problems, for some countries, the problems are smaller. If, well, thinking about y y Yugoslavia, it's certainly an issue because there is a lot of mobility around. But the question is what we want to study about Yugoslavia. If, if you want to study productivity, probably individual scopus IDs are available. It's not an issue of having similar names. It's an issue of changing places. So in a worst case scenario, we can forget about mobility issues and we can study productivity or productivity patterns. For some places, some issues do not work. If you, if you think of China again, gender doesn't work as an issue. If you think perhaps of Yugoslavia, maybe mobility doesn't work as an issue. But overall, I would suggest that this type of data may be very useful. I'm not saying it's you know panaceum for all our problems in, 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 in the area. And I'm suggesting surveys are enormously important, but still we can use uh, big data for some countries, for some problems. Uh, that, that, that would be my answer. Great, well, thank you. Um, let me get to a question that was submitted uh, uh, today. Through a critical lens, um, this work exposes the national stratification based on relative state capacity for research. In other words, different countries have different amounts of research that they do. Um, are low resource nations really non-performers? In other words, can you account for the fact that resources play an important role here? Yeah, I would say this is a perfect example of ongoing stratification in higher education and in higher education research. We can see through this data that there are places in the world where research is limited and there are places in the world in in where research is just booming. And we know it We know it from a year by year, on a year by year basis, we see the concentration. And certainly the answer is forget about big data and let's focus on national data sets. Because in those places which we assess as low performers, perhaps there's a lot of, 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 a lot of research ongoing in the national language, yes. We can have national national sources and national databases, but we don't have citations for them. We don't have data arranged over time. We don't have IDs. We have nothing to be really working with except for those play, those researchers from those countries. But they will never do comparative studies or global studies. So yes, stratification is a big issue. I would say even more, access to big data is a big issue. I've been struggling for years to have access to raw data because raw data is not the data which you can when can have if you have access to scopus is absolutely different issue or or and if you have access to to clarivate analytics core core collection we are not talking about publications and access to publications we are talking about access to raw data millions and billions of numbers small numbers which you have to calculate and you have to have a server uh, to, to work with and software to work with and pay for access most of all. We paid uh, between 300 and 400 thousand dollars for three years access to the data. It's only three years. So access to raw data is enormously expensive and it's limited to us in our research project. We cannot distribute it. We cannot share it because of the limitations of a license. So again, stratification, not only of research, but also stratifications of research agendas, of research problems. In some places, you cannot research some issues because you don't have the data. It's an issue and, I, I, well, I can see it. Great, thank you. Um, we have an interesting question. Um, with the growing uh, precarity of academic professions and the number of faculty focused primarily on teaching rather than research, how, does, how can big data help analyze their trajectories if they leave what really turns out to be limited digital traces in, their, in the bibliometric data, uh, databases for those faculty? Yeah. 
Yes, I would say it's 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 fantastic question because we have to be thinking more in terms of scientists doing science or publishing scientists and scholars rather than higher education researchers and academics. It's a fissure here. Digital traces are not left by teaching mostly or teaching only academics. It's a big issue for higher education research and for higher education, for career studies. But again, we do what we can. We can complain that we don't have the data, but we can also use the opportunity that for, for those areas where we do have the data. So I agree for publishing academics, for non-publishing academics, for non-performers, for teaching only scholars, we don't have this type of data at all. But still you have millions of others, publishers, uh, top performers, bottom performers, low performers who are, who, whose, whose traces are digitally available. And there is a trade-off. Do we want to say, okay, no data is available about teaching academics, so big data is useless. Or we have at least some data about publishing academics. We could be saying, okay, career, academic careers of publishing scientists, and that would be true, instead of academic careers of all, of all, of all, of all scientists. There is a trade-off. Uh, um, you know, there's no panacea, there's no perfect data sets around. This is what we have. Great. Let, let me ask you a, a kind of a, a follow up, it's somewhat stranger question. Um, uh, for students, many universities take big data uh, about every aspect of student life, including when they go to the cafeteria, when they enter their dorms, etc., and try to use those data. Uh, about students, and it is a lot of data, even for a single university, to predict which students would be in trouble, to predict which students could benefit from help, et cetera. Do you foresee a, um, a similar type of activity occurring at universities for the professions, for, prof for professors and other academics? Oh, yes. I mean, there, there is, there, there, I can't say it's a danger because it's, it's already ongoing. It's the power of big data analytics and, and predicting algorithms. It's not only that we can know a lot about people based on their tweeters. We can know a lot about students knowing from what they do and, uh, uh, and, and how they spend time, et cetera, et cetera, based on you know, campus data. It's also about us professors. It's not ongoing massively because it's, it's also a bit delicate issue, but we can predict a lot. A, a small prediction I did about about in, in this Polish study about full professors. Once highly productive, almost always highly productive. Once unproductive, almost always, almost always unproductive. It's a very small and very delicate example that we can know more and more because we produce models retroactively and we produce and we predict for the future. It's not really ongoing at the moment because we academics do it about ourselves. We don't want to do too much about ourselves, but it's perfectly possible to predict. Well, obviously we academics are unpredictable. We change our minds. We have life stories. We have, you know, hot streaks and, and wonderful times. And we have kids when we are more busy, et cetera. It's not fully predictable, but to, to an extent, our research is somehow predictable, somehow predictable. I don't want to, I don't want to, 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 to say too much about it because it's just, just um, a bit of ongoing research. I would hate predicting us as human beings, as academics. I would hate it, but I know it's ongoing. We are like customers. Customers are also predictable. We are clustered into different clusters, as you know, young moms or old moms or, or soccer moms or whatever. And we academics can also be clustered, but uh, it's just the future, I believe, I hope. I do too, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question that was sent in, um, with regarding, uh, with re regarding academic performance, how do you take into account different affiliations in global big data, diversified affiliations or scholars dividing work between universities, perhaps even in different countries. Yeah, we, we, we know most of all from, from big data, we know the scale of mobility. 
we see the scale in the past two, three decades. We know the percentages of, of scientists who actually change countries. We're not talking about millions or big, big percentages. We know the data. The most travelers are between UK, US, Australia, uh, Hong Kong, a couple of Anglo Anglophone countries, huge mobility. But if you think of Europe, the mobility is much, much lower than expected. Uh, what, is, what is the best answer to do productivity studies related to mobility? It's probably distinction between those who never moved, like stairs, and those who moved a lot, like those who have, say, three affiliations or more over their lifetime. So you compare patterns between those movers or you know, big movers and those stairs. Um, it's at least some distinction w w w w which is possible. And if we want to attach affiliation to a person, to a scientist, our approach is to attach the current affiliation, which is provided in Scopus and which is provided in, in Web of Science. Current affiliation, because the percentage of those uh, traveling, traveling scholars is not big. You can cut the subsample and focus on those who stay, who, who don't move much. But as I say, it is an issue and it's been studied uh, in, in detail uh, generally. Uh, it's an issue of, in, of inbreeding. Are you staying, if you are staying in the same institution for your life, are you more productive or, le or less productive? And if you move along a lot, are you more productive? And the answer which already Philip Albach gave us with surveys a few years ago in a book about inbreeding is not so, it's not, it's not the same for all countries. For some countries, inbreeding is good. For other countries, inbreeding doesn't work in terms of productivity. So, well, all those global, global data can give us more insights on a per country basis, perhaps, per country basis. Great, thank you. Here's another interesting question. And by the way, I just remind, want to remind those of you out there, you're still welcome to submit questions via the chat function on YouTube. And I'll try to get to as many as possible. So here's another question. Um, you've mentioned that computer scientists studying academic professions have weak theoretical frameworks compared to higher education researchers. Could you please elaborate? What kinds of theories computer scientists rely on and what theories in higher education are most promising for testing and discussing big data. Yeah, this is this is a difference of approach between generally data scientists and social scientists. Data scientists work with numbers, tables, visualizations, graphs, and we, well, more, perhaps more traditional social scientists were, work with words, citations, uh, quotations theories. If, we com if you compare papers in, in academic career studies, which I did in the past few days because of this presentation, I, I was reading 20, 20 papers by, by computer scientists about academic careers, you see the following. There is like half a page or one page maximum of what we call theoretical framework and previous discussions or literature so far. It's so it's somehow unnecessary. You produce compelling results based on the data. And if you look at our type of research, it is 10 pages of you know, theoretic frameworks and the various, various um, uh, hypotheses so far and literature review so far, et cetera. And it makes a difference. It makes a difference. We know more because we think historically. We look at say gender, issues from the past 30 years with Mary Frank Fox studying gender and, and, and Zuckerman and Merton studying gender and sex differences 50 years ago. We just know it. In data science, everyone is young and the discipline is young. So there are fewer expectations regarding theories. And what I mean, so this is a difference in terms of theoretical frameworks. Perhaps this is the reason why data scientists are so compelling they don't feel so much constrained by all those past issues. They calculate, they show it to us, and mostly we say, wow. We say, wow, in science, we say, wow, in nature, we say, we, we say, oh, in other areas. So this is a convincing way of doing research. Certainly our advantage is the past, past fears. And testing means uh, we look at Merton 
and we look at surveys and we apply big data and we see what happens. This is, this is the way of testing theories, which I have in mind. We produce new theories, but also we test what you have had for decades in our area. Great, thank you. So you mentioned the issues associated with small numbers, that the need to get large numbers in order to get statistical accuracy and therefore more predictability or, or, or confidence in, in, in results. What One thing I, I was curious about is, do you also worry a lot about systematic effects? That, for example, say, uh, um, possible biases in the sample itself. Is that something that is an active area that you need to be constantly concerned about in addition to the statistical issues that you mentioned? I, I believe it's a big issue. I mean, biases are a big issue. Let's look at the data sets. They are already biased. They are Anglo-Saxon. They are STEM focused. They are, um, well, English language bias. So there are biases around. We need to be measuring them and be aware of them. Uh, let's suppose the OECD world is publishing much more massively in, 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 in say, uh, um, Scopus journals than the newcomers. Think of Poland. Poland had, all in all, in the past two decades, had 50,000 offers, individual ID, IDs, which, which we studied, 50,000. And in the past, no, 75,000. And in the past year, it was 50,000. So we are newcomers and we are beginning to publish massively in Scopus. So if you take five years now, it will be different five years than five years, 20 years ago, when we, when we are not present. It is another bias. So we have biases by countries, by language, by disciplines. The most maybe salient issue is social sciences and humanities. We in Poznan do STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, because we are aware that science, science that that um, social sciences and humanities journals are underrepresented, because national languages are underrepresented. In science, say physics, it's English. Well, in history, it's Polish or Russian or German or French and a bit of English. So we know all those biases, and we have to be, be aware of them. Um, and they can be certainly studied systematically, I'm sure. But at the same time, we have a big picture, like some ideas, and then some people have to be doing smaller pictures, like, okay, let's focus on biases in big data if we relate it to career studies. It's a work for many people for a long time, uh, but we have to start with something, look around, and perhaps then look at the details. My experience tells me it's, it's impossible to do everything at, at, at one time. That certainly is true. Um, so what a reader sent in a question, um, or, uh, uh, an observer sent in a question, what is the impact and implications to minority serving institutions of higher education? And I might generalize that question to ask, are there subclasses of universities that are useful to studies and to study, and um, have you found interesting results for some of those subclasses of universities? Yes, that's a very good issue. In server research, you basically are unable to to to, to classify institutions massively because the numbers go down. In big data, you can have say top institutions or research intensive institutions in the U.S. two hundred or top. 200 institutions in Leiden ranking or in Shanghai ranking, you can do very specific specific classifications and work and see the differences. And we, we are basically working along these lines using Leiden ranking uh, uh, and uh, the idea of research intensive universities. I'm almost sure that the productivity theories work much better for research intensive universities and may not be working for, for liberal arts colleges or teaching focus universities, or generally for, for not research intensive institutions. So I see the differences and, 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 and basically the data are available in, in massive numbers for those research intensive institutions. And they are not available for those teaching focus ones because there's not around people around who publish and not 
uh, not uh, the numbers are just too small to take into consideration. We take uh, limits, no, not limits, but maybe thresholds. Uh, we, we, we don't study institutions for, who, for which the numbers are too small. Numbers of people, publishing scientists, or the numbers of publications per year, or in a decade or so. So we cut institutions into classes. And certainly those massively publishing institutions are where are better examples, but we can have also, we can also study those outliers, small things, small countries, small everything. These, all those deviations are possible if we combine the you know, exceptions and combine the deviations or, or, or outliers, we can do this. Great, thank you. Um, another question that was sent in, higher education research has been multidisciplinary for years, but most researchers coming from social sciences and humanities. In the future, do you think that there'll be more researchers with data science or computer science background in the higher education research centers and education departments? What do you see as the future of academic careers in higher education research? Oh, this is this presentation is, is, is like a like a, like a call. Let us consider what others are doing not to be left behind without the awareness of being left behind. There are dozens of publications about academic careers, which we don't really care because they are statistically advanced. They are working on millions of, of data, the data to which we don't have access, but we can't disregard these publications because it may happen that this area, careers, academic profession, may be somehow monopolized within a decade because they are convincing, they appear in top journals, they are expansionary, and we don't show this expansion. My feeling is, I will tell you frankly, I spent a decade in survey research, and while I was about to spend another decade with my colleagues, fantastic colleagues doing, I would say, the same surveys in slightly different countries with the same numbers. I like it a lot. I say it's useful and interesting. But for me, it was not enough. And for many people in this area, it's not enough because we really need to be more convincing. And convincing today means numbers, granulation, uh, outliers, deviations, not only the same picture as we had, say, a decade ago or two decades ago. I would say we had foundations 30 years ago with Philip Altbach. We had many, many projects in the meantime, in which I also participated. And now it's time maybe to consider, just consider other options. One of them is, 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 is bibliometric data, administrative data, national registries, all those different types of data, which we never used. Well, one kind of data that actually is beginning, beginning to be more and more available is personal data data about uh, income, data about taxes paid, data about marriages and children, and um, other kinds of da data that you might regard as personal. Do you see an increasing role in correlating or using those data in studies of higher education researchers? Yes, we know about the data and we know how difficult they are to, to, to have access to. Uh, so these are, there are huge privacy issues. We know we could, well, in my case, I could try to integrate all my data with all Polish scientists with, say, text, text, text office data. I can't do this, but the state can, is able to do this. So you can uh, relate tax data, let's say, well, all, all the salaries of, of doctoral students in the future over the lifetimes. After some years, you have the data. Uh, uh, or, 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 or the salaries of, of uh, academics, depending on university type or location or affiliation, etc. With tax data as an example of, of private data, you can do a lot. But it's enormously ethically complicated. And I wouldn't like to have this data. I use salary data in surveys. And I did a study. I was comparing top earners and top performers. Top earners meaning those self-declared high salary, high salaried. Uh, and, and the answer was, yes, they produce a lot. They are top producers in terms of research. There's a correlation. But if we think of big data and personal data, I'm very much afraid of it because I know 
how easy it is to have wrong correlations and also to have far-reaching, far-reaching uh, conclusions, which, which can be hurtful, for instance. So I'm very much afraid of this far going uh, integration of data, text data, health data, academic profession data, all those data sets, which are technically, technically somewhere. Well, thank you, Merrick. Uh, unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but this has been an extremely stimulating hour that we've spent together. And I wanna thank all of the people that are out there who've submitted questions. We got through a fairly large number of questions in this time. And so I wanna thank you all for participating as well through your questions. Um, this has been a, a great experience hearing you, Merrick, and uh, it's clear that big data has an increasingly important role to play in higher education research. And um, I'm excited about the possibilities for the future. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for running the show. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for your participations. I'm very grateful. It was a great hour to me. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And to those of you who are out there, um, we do run a regular seminar series through the Center for Studies in Higher Education. So check out our website and um, we will have more webinars and more speakers.